Let's see. Well, Joan Mitchell is a wonderful painter, and I've I've known her work. You know, I think I started to learn about her when I was a student, and and back in the seventies, I would go and see her shows. Um. Uh. So basically, she is an abstract painter. Um, she draws from memory, from poetry, from music, from observation um, as the, kind of the source of her, her painting, but also the material itself, the paint itself and how it goes on the canvas. The, you know, the range of marking in her work is, is quite remarkable from very thin turpentine washes uh, to kind of nervous linear passages, um, impost, thick impostos, really heavy crusted paint in areas down to bare canvas and other, other spots. Um, so I'm gonna read a few things here. Uh, her primary medium was oil. Um, she was a professional uh, basically from the 50s. She um, went to um, Smith College and then uh, Columbia and then graduated from the Art Institute of Chicago and then came to New York and began her career in the early 50s. Um, so basically her work kind of went through cycles and, and you know, these multitude of periods um, Shifts in her work would typically coincide with shifts in her surroundings and the landscape that she was living in, um, personal relationships, um, and major events in her life. Um, oh, by the way, we didn't say this, but if you guys have any questions that come up while, while we're doing this, um, you can uh, put them in the, the little, type them into the chat. Right. We're not we're not responding to um, uh, calls raised but, or raised yeah. hands, and yep. I just want to mention a couple of other things. Um, I did forget to talk about the chat, and just to tell everybody that we archive all of Larry's and actually all of our programs. So you could always go to our website and look under library programs and lectures and see everything that we've done. So if you can't make any of the lectures, just go and you'll see it um, on your screen. And the other yeah. thing I want to mention is people said, is this the last of the series? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> Larry is going. <laughs> He'll talk about what's coming up. We don't have it out yet, but um, he's going to be doing every Friday. So um, you will have an amazing education in the about the art world after this. Okay, Larry, take okay. it away. Right. Okay. Uh, so again, back to that. Um, one of the reasons why I chose... Joan Mitchell is is there is a major retrospective that is in the process of being put together. Um, it it supposedly was going to open um, this fall in in Baltimore, um, but that has been put off until the spring now, um, given COVID and all that. It's going to tour from there out to San Francisco. And eventually, it's going to work its way back to the Guggenheim. They have the dates of 2021 down, but we'll see if it's 2021 or 2022. Anyway, this is a major retrospective that's going to work its way around, and and it's very exciting to me. Um, and hopefully, it will be to you guys, too, by the time we're done with this. Um, so, okay. One of the things that she said was, my paintings repeat a feeling about Lake Michigan or water or fields. It's more like a poem. Um, that's what I want to paint. So she was a very literate painter, um, read a lot of poetry, um, listened to a lot of jazz and Bach and all that. Those were, those were really kind of places that she got her inspiration. Um, Things that comprised or moved Mitchell, you know, water, sky, trees, flowers, weather, dogs, uh, created imagery and memories, and she translated those things into form and space. 
Um, she worked primarily at night. Um, she was, she was um, basically a heavy drinker, heavy smoker, and it's no wonder she only lasted to 66. She died in 1992. Born in, let's see, when was she born? She was born in 1925, so she was 67 when she died um, in 92. Unfortunately for all of us, I wish she didn't smoke and drink quite so much. Um, and, you know, her larger paintings were what she was better known for. Um, but I'm going to move on to more images and let's move on to the next. Next. There we go. Okay. So. Um, this is, this is from 1956. She was, she was pretty much established at that point. She had been labeled, uh, second generation abstract expressionist, which she did not really like being called very much. Um, but you know, in that, in that scene, she could smoke and drink with the, and cuss with the best of the guys at the Cedar Bar, and used to do that all the time. Um, so here is Arshel Gorky, who was, he died, he died in the late 40s, I believe, um, who was one of the kind of fathers of abstract expressionism. Um, he um, uh, influenced her, as you can see in, in this, and she was really open to a lot of the influences of people around her. Um, uh, Pollock, de Kooning, um, and so, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a few things about the technical things that she was working with. This business of figure ground, okay? The idea behind this is in, in this painting, this uh, hemlock painting, um, you can see, let me see if I can come up with the pointer. Yeah, there we go. Um, wait a minute, pointer. There we go. Um, you can see in here, there's this white that's painted back over the underpainting. So the white of the canvas is kind of this ground that she pulls back over what she has painted. So the, the, the constant tension between what's, what's the background and what's the foreground is something that she's playing with over and over again throughout her paintings. You can see how those those the white shape is is actually very active because she brought that back out and made that interplay with the layers of paint that were on top. Uh, so basically, there's this business of 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 the gesture of she. She knew de Kooning and she was friends with him. You know, she went to his studio and she saw his work and he really, you know, he really responded well to her and they, they talked a lot together. Um, so you can see how the, the force of the gesture of the, of the application of paint, how that activated the surface. Um, and you can see, especially in, in Pollock's, I mean, in, in de Kooning's work, this figure ground activity again, you know, what's underneath, what's on top. There's this tension between the flatness of the surface and the, and the layers of paint going back and forth between what's underneath and what's on top. Let's see. Next. And again, in here, you can see how that white has been brought back up over the top, and then some of this paint, the 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 okra is brought back over the the top of the painting again. Um, let me see what I've got here. I've got some more notes.
so the you know basically she was accepted by the guys quite a bit um larry yes um we just had a comment um that gorky died in tw in july 21 1948 48 yeah yeah okay yeah. so uh, that that painting that i showed was the year before he died um he he did commit suicide but he was i believe he had cancer so it's one of those things. Um, let's see. Ah, so at this point, I'm going to go back previous. Uh, at this point, she has been going back and forth. She's been married, divorced. She's been going back and forth to, to France. In, in 1955, I believe it was, she met um, the French Canadian painter Riopal in in um, in France, and they had a very intense affair, and she continued to commute back and forth between um, France and and um, um, and the United States and New York City. She was showing in galleries constantly. You know, her work had been picked up by by a good a good gallery, so she was actually selling fairly well. Um, she had been, you know, in in let's see, when was it? It was in 1950. Uh, let's see, next, yeah, in in 1957. Um, she was, she was like the, the subject of an article, of, um, by Irving Sandler, um, in, in the, uh, Art News magazine, where basically he, um, followed her, actually, he went to her studio and they, they talked about her painting process and he would work, you know, basically to write an article about her painting process. Um, she really was very, very, very specific about what she was after. These, these paintings look very loose and, 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 and playful. That was an aspect of what she did, but she also was very, very scrupulous about the mark making. She, well, that's interesting because somebody asked about yes. are these paintings, um, how much planning goes into these paintings and is it spontaneous and do they plan out which, and does she plan out what colors to use ahead of time? Do you know? Uh, yes. And yes. <laughs> um, she, she actually, she actually did do sketches and things like that, smaller scale pieces which are really beautiful. And some of those will be in the upcoming retrospective. Um, she, she really um, set up her palette to some degree beforehand, um, thinking about the memories and what colors evoke those memories for her and, and how those work. Um, how they how they actually interact and and what's going on with that she she would she would paint fairly vigorously while she was painting but she would go there and put on maybe five or ten strokes and then step back away from the painting to really to really look at what she was doing and how those how those marks were affecting the whole painting was she influenced by kandinsky uh, she was influenced by Kandinsky uh, from her early period. Um, the improvisations and things like that affected her. But by this time, she was much more affected by somebody like uh, Pollock, de Kooning, um, um, and, and Gorky, rather than Kandinsky. Um, she also was listening to jazz. She loved bebop. I mean, she would listen to she would listen to um, uh, Charlie Parker and Miles Davis and Bach. I mean, she would listen to these things before she would start the painting, get herself 
in the right mood. So you can see there's a certain kind of dance going on here. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw back to her childhood. She grew up with a father who was very demanding. Um, he wanted a boy. As a matter of fact, he wrote John on her birth certificate before she was born. And when she was born as a Joan, he changed that John to Joan. But, but he was very demanding. And she actually was a champion figure skater and diver in her, in her childhood. She was academically very, very, um, very bright. And um, as Smith College Columbia and and Chicago Institute of Arts say, but um, there's a physicality to her music, to her painting, to her music, to her paintings. There's a dance that goes on with these lines. There's this figure skating aspect, that edge. There's a precision to it, but it's also it's also there's a there's this lyricism. There's this sense of 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 movement of of that vibrant interaction between the mark and the color so uh in the, in the 60s in the late 60s she and Rhea Paul bought a house um north of of um of Paris on the Seine. And, and in actuality, there was a cottage on the property that was down next to the river that Monet actually painted in um, earlier. He, he, had, he had done a whole series of Seine paintings and, and that, was, that was his, you know, that was where he, he lived and worked. So it's, it's very interesting to look at on the on the right, we have the wisteria and this this open, loose um, quality of brushwork in 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 those Monets, and you can see the direct relationship between these things. Although I don't don't know that that Joan was looking directly at this piece when she when she um, went into this given the fact that she's calling this piece Chicago. So it's, it's hearkening back to her memories of being on Lake Michigan and being, you know, uh, in that, the, those, those intense weather changes and things like that, that she would experience coming over Lake Michigan. Okay. So wet orange. You know, this is again, very large scale piece. Um, she would work her her studio in in um, in the country. Uh, she had a nice studio space. It was, but it was only 15 feet wide by about mm, I I think they said 14 feet tall by 30 feet long. So she could only paint two of these panels, and this is a triptych. So there are three panels here. She could only paint two of these panels up next to each other at a time. And she would have to envision what they would be like when they interacted. She called this period her territories. So she started to get into inter, this interplay with these blocks of color, playing off of this, this kind of atmospheric brushwork that harkens again back to a little bit of, of good old Monet, but there were a lot of people that were that were doing this kind of atmospheric work. There was uh, Philip Guston was working this way. Um, there were there were a lot of expat painters that were that were in um, in Paris during that period that she would interact with too. Um, so. What I'm going to do is move on to the next. What we have here is this wonderful, juicy, sun-drenched Bonard. And you can kind of see how the color interaction was something that she would, that she would play with. And this, this 
this broken, distorted grid, this hovering pattern of color that Bonard would would create in the, a sort of environment of color, and that's something that 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 I see in Joan Mitchell that she emulated. Even the color in this is so reminiscent of that. And on the right, we have Hans Hoffman. Okay, so this is another story. Uh, Hans Hoffman was a very, very, very renowned teacher um, at the time um, when she was coming up in the 50s. She went to take a class with him and she lasted through one class. She just could not understand half of what he was saying in his heavy German accent. And he was, he was painting, he was drawing on other people's drawings and things like that. And she just like, you know, she didn't get it. So she kind of walked out. But in this period of time, she began to come to terms with some of what, you know, in the 50s, she was very resistant to the French influence. But as you can see, she really embraced it in the 60s and 70s. And, and one of the things that Hoffman brought to people in, in America were the notions of modernism. And this, there's this whole idea of push-pull in painting, okay, in colors. When colors are up against one another, there's a tendency for things to come forward and things to recede. So greens are a cool color. They tend to recede. Reds are warm colors. They tend to come forward. So you can see the tension between that red that's in the background and that green that's in the foreground. And the fact that that green is, is on top of the red and the blue, which is also cool, pressing back against, against the green. So the tension between that red in the background that wants to come forward, the green that wants to recede, and the blue that wants to press back and join with that green, that, that blue that's in the background. So there's, there's this play that's going on. It, and Joan, Mitchell began to address that a little bit more consciously in, in, this, in this time. So again, you can see in, in this piece, I'm gonna move myself out of the way. Um, you can see the, the play between those, those areas of color and, and how, how they play with each other, how that, that that blue seems to sink back. Um, and then this business of the weeds, uh, you know, Joan, Joan was constantly back and forth between um, these, these solid patterns and, and the, the broken linear patterns in, the, in, these, in these more substantial um, landscape oriented pieces. Let's see. So again, the staccato sort of uh, feel of the these these lines that she lines of force that she was using. You know, again, she loved her dogs. She had she had a. Um, uh, a uh, standard poodle that she loved and used to go swimming and all that stuff. Um, you know, that, that, that dog was really, you know, totally out of control and heel, sit, stay was something that that dog never paid any attention to. <laughs> but the mood of the piece and, uh, and the, the way she would allow the light to show through it and and you know these these combinations of 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 different sensory levels that she would address. Um, one of the things that that I really think I do want to talk about is is you know this was this was a period of time when I was actually really familiar with her work. I I saw 
the exhibit where this painting and a group of others were at Xavier Fourcade um, uh, on, uh, I think it was East 75th Street. Um, and these paintings still smelled of wet oil paint when I walked into the, the, the gallery. There's, there's um, a combination of things and she actually had a, a thing called um, kinesthesis, which, which actually mixed your senses. She had, she had a set, um, uh, sound had color. Um, 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 movement would have, would have taste. Smells, again, would have color or physical or physical feelings in her body. So this is an interesting thing, which is which is it involved and and in her work. Um, it's it it really is this this kind of these moods have color. So her blues were real blues. Again, you know, the, this vocabulary that she would develop in, in, in different periods, she would play them out. You know, this whole business of these short, strong strokes and leaving the, leaving the the lattice work of air the 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 white to show through okay so um this piece actually is in the collection of the museum uh, the metropolitan museum um I'm going to move myself again, um, and and you know basically this piece was life in Rosie Hughes, you know La Vie en Rose, um, painted with a black brush. Okay, so what goes on here is 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 basically she broke up with Rhea Paul in I believe it was 1977 or 78 or something like that. So she didn't paint for about a year in there somewhere. Um, he used to call her La Vie en Rose. Um, and, and, you know, basically emotionally, she was very, very struck by the abandonment of this. He left her with um, a studio assistant that had been that had been working with with um, Joan for two or three years, who she really loved too. So um, Joan was Joan was a tough character, and and she she was she was really you know kind of um, you know the alcohol business doesn't help anything as far as your nature is concerned so she could be very moody and very tough and very argumentative at times but she was also very generous and very generous to young art students and young painters um especially young women painters because she knew what kind of a rough world they were coming into so she would help young women painters who would come to her and and give them studio space to paint in in in, in Paris or pay for their materials or take them out to dinner or take them out with when curators would come to visit her and introduce them. Um, so you know this was very this betrayal was very hard on her when when Rhea Paul left with this woman. Um, But she got over it. <laughs> so this vibrant, really beautiful, gorgeous, you know, intense painting came out 
you know, just after that Lovio Rose piece and maybe at the same time as that was going on. The interesting part about her pieces is the boundaries, is how she would break them and how she would work with them or work up against them. You know, it's, it's really kind of, if you look at the edges and where these paintings meet and how they meet and how they interact, you know, looking at how, you know, there's these dark, under paintings that are underneath that that bright vibrant cadmium yellow and and all that you know this is this is something which she really thought out she was like really planning through the layering of this stuff and all those drips and drools and dribbles you know basically you can see that there are washes of that that kind of purple you know cobalt underneath the surface and you know she really planned out which how this was going to interact and what was going on and you know allowed those under those undercolors to dry to some degree in order for that those impostos and those thicker yellow layers to come on over the top of it without getting dirty without you know uh, muddying up which is which is no mean feet i can tell you as a painter it ain't easy <laughs> and this one is called minnesota you know basically you know she did she was a child of the middle west she grew up in in chicago and she saw a lot of this stuff when she when she was younger uh passed through her, her sister lived in California, so she did go out, drive out to visit her when she was in New York. Um, and that, that became kind of a yearly visit. So uh, they, were, they were very close. Um, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna play with this. Well, Larry, before yeah. we have a couple of questions, by the way, everyone, this is my favorite painting, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of time looking at this. Um, Someone wanted to know that with paintings this big, do the eighth and a quarter inches matter? No. Okay. <laughs> Not, <laughs> at <all. sure. laughs> Not at all. Not at all. That that matters to the the curatorial staff. That okay. matters to archiving the works and and individuating them from one another. To us, it makes absolutely no difference. Uh, <laughs> but you know. The mark making, that makes a difference. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, the, these two end panels, they're narrower, they, they interact with one another. And the tension that's happening with her spreading them out with these two big generous paintings in the middle, these two generous panels, she really gave that a lot of thought. And the tension between the sizes of those of those dimension the dimensions of those pieces that that was important to her, and she thought about that. And now I'm going to go into well, some. Larry, yeah. before you go, go on, I just want to tell everyone that you have this absolutely beautiful book. What is it called? Well, um, that you it, it it is called the title of 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 this of this whole talk. I carry my landscapes around with me. Oh, okay. This was and this was a show that happened uh, last summer at mm -hmm. at uh, David's Warner Gallery. And you showed it us uh, some of us these paintings, the images of these paintings. Yes, I and, did. Uh, they were all and blown here are the close-ups. Oh God! All right. And I'll here let you are go. the details right here. All right. <laughs> I will. I'll go back into the background. Yes. So. These are these give you some idea. These luscious strokes are are actually in the book um, to the scale of what they they actually look like in the painting. So what I'm going to do is just pop back one, and and this is coming from somewhere in here. And so you can see the the quality, the sensitivity of the brushwork and how, and how the, those, those marks interact with each other. Um, keep going. 
okay, and this is kind of some of that stuff that's toward the bottom of the canvas and sort of ground it. And you can see how, you know, there's these crusty, let's see, there are these crusty kind of areas in there. And you can see how the drips and the, and the, the drag over, over the, the under, underpainted layers are showing through. Okay, and here is a full shot of of that of that painting in the gallery, so you can get a sense of what the scale is like and the immersion into these into these enormous pieces. Okay, and. You know, this piece is very interesting too. I mean, basically there's a, there, this was her psychiatrist and, and her friend, somebody who she knew and she died that year. And, and um, Joan painted this painting as a homage to her. Um, Now there's a sense of loyalty, you know, and and again I'll go back to she would befriend these young painters, and and there were a lot of 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 poets who she was very close to, um, uh, Ashbery and and uh, John O'Hara. He she actually illustrated some of John O'Hara's poems, um, so she was she was constantly reading poetry and integrating that that sense of lyricism into into the work but it never got to the point where the niceness of the work over overcame uh the the visceral response to putting on the paint and here's a detail from that painting this book is really wonderful. It's available. It's only forty bucks from the from the uh, David Warner Gallery. So if you if you're looking for a book to get before the the uh, the new uh, catalog comes out for the retrospective that's on its way, uh, this is one that I'd recommend. Uh, okay. And. So this is this is a scene from her home, from looking up the valley at the Seine. You know, basically she would see these atmospheric things happening. You know, and and just integrate it with the fields of of of, of cultivated farmland and things like that that were around her. And again, back to this business of music and the musicality of these pieces is really remarkable. Um, you know, the grand view. This is, you know, you can look at this and see how, you know, if, you see, if you've ever seen some of those Monet garden pieces where he's painting the pathway through the garden, these are like taking those things and blowing them up, you know, 10 times the size that they that they were in the garden <laughs> this period in in her career she was becoming rather ethereal i mean these pieces dissolve you know they appear and they disappear it's kind of like fog it's it's this whole business of the figure ground stuff where that white is coming over and pushing down the green and the green comes back over the top of it you know that play of the yellow playing over the top of the green and back underneath it you know this weaving back and forth of these strokes and that that business of of where are we in space it's sort of hovering there. Um, it it reminded me of of 
of the Mount Saint-Vitoir pieces that Cézanne painted towards the end of his life. And I threw up one of these, basically this one on the, on the left is called Faded Air. Um, and you can see, you know, basically she's painting the air. She's painting how the air interacts with the, with the, the ground, with the earth, with the, with the foliage. And if you look at the Cezanne, how that kind of Mount Saint-Vitoir sort of hovers up into that sky and dissolves into the sky, you know, this play between flattening and, and spatiality. This is a play that, that Joan was very, very conscious of. And so was Cezanne. Okay, so now we move on to the sunflowers. You know, she was looking at Van Gogh. She was looking at these things. She was going to Paris. She was looking at the, and, and there were all these fields of sunflowers and things like that that she would pass through and that she would see in the farms near, near her property. So let's see if I can zoom in on a section of this so you can get some idea. Well, it's a little blurry when I, blur, when I come in, but these are very thick impostos. In, in the in the yellows and even even the background is painted fairly thickly and painted up to it and then the yellow is brought back over the top of that so and you can see you know the play between between the drips and the linear elements and all that this kind of nervous energy this this business of 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 the play back and forth between solidity and 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 fluidity uh, between the ice skating aspect of 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 Joan Mitchell and uh, and that that one who was reaching for Bach, reaching for the formal structure, reaching for the pattern that that would that would reinforce it. You can see this white is kind of painted back into it, and then the yellow comes back over the top of it. Um, these are really conscious choices. And she would, these were very meditative paintings in a lot of ways. Now, you know, she developed um, cancer of the jaw at this point. Uh, so there, there were some dark, dark phases that she went through. Um, and, uh, you know, but she continued to paint her way through it. By this point in 1992, the, the cancer of the jaw went away, but, uh, she, she had lung cancer and, um, you know, uh, the, it, the amazing part was that she had the energy. This is a huge painting. It's 102 by 157 inches. This lady, even, even under chemotherapy and the primitive kinds of therapies that they had in 92, compared to where we are now, you know, it's amazing that she had the will to get out there and paint this thing. Um, but, you know, she definitely had the blues at that point. And here's, here's a detail from that piece and the kind of vigorous quality that, that, that was going into those, that juicy slashing painting. Larry, did she have yeah. a staff that was directing, uh, that she was directing to paint for her? No, no, never. Really? Absolutely never. She had assistants who helped her set up the paintings, who helped her you know, mix things and to set things up and move the paintings around. But as a matter of fact, I, a friend of mine who I went to college with was a studio assistant of hers for one summer. And he said she was a beast, that she would paint all night long. She would get up at, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon, have her, have her breakfast and go and paint. And she would be very demanding on her on her studio assistants as far as 
moving things around as far as, you know, getting the paint ready for her and things like that. But she never let anybody else touch her paintings. Unlike a lot of the dudes that are out there now, this, this is not something that she would do. It's impossible. This is something, it's like Gerhard Richter. He did not let, he does not let other people paint his paintings. They would mix his painting for, paint for him. They would do that. But for this, for this lady, that was, you know, she would, she would really keep these, these uh, Medaglia d'Oro cans of, of uh, uh, coffee cans full of paint out there and thin it with the right amount of turpentine for her use. Um, she'd keep those colors around her. A lot of these paintings are deteriorating because of her technical practices, because she would do layers of the thin turpentine over very thick impostos. She would paint thick impostos over undried paint underneath it. They're cracking, they're deteriorating, they're changing in color. But you know what? They're still gorgeous things to behold. And, and definitely go and see the retrospective that's on its way around because these paintings are not going to be in the shape that they're in forever. Let's see. Next. Okay. So we're reaching the end, end of things. So Joan Mitchell's quote is, I carry my landscapes around with me. Basically her, her um, sense of, of, of the landscape, of, of, of color, of tonality, of all of this, how it inter, inter, interwove through her life. Um, they're really very powerful experiential things for her. Um, there is a there is a um, a biography out called Joan Mitchell, Lady Painter, which Joan Mitchell referred to herself as Lady Painter uh, in a in a very uh, uh self-effacing manner but very cynical um she was she was very caustic when it came to the new york art world she you know she hooked up with Rhea Paul and 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 stayed with him but for all of the success that she had in the new york art market she really felt that she she had been underrated and that certainly is not the case now. I think, you know, basically uh, her, her paintings are fetching astronomical prices and they are going to go rapidly up as this, this um, retrospective works its way across the country. As far as I'm concerned, calling her a second generation abstract expressionist is a very diminutive to call, very diminutive thing to call somebody who really had her own voice and invented her own way of speaking with that voice. Um, so there is a lecture by this woman, Patricia Albers, and I put the YouTube um, link up there. I don't know if you can actually use the YouTube link, but if you put in uh, Joan Mitchell Lady Painter and put in Patricia Albers name when you go to YouTube, you'll come up with this. And it's an hour long talk. It's well worth listening to. There, there is a bio um, documentary <clears throat> on her work, but it doesn't seem to be available any longer. It was done in 1992, just after she died. It was, it was put out there. There was a retrospective of her work at uh, the Whitney, which was really a wonderful retrospective. Uh, there was a retrospective of her work in the 60s at the Whitney also. So her work has been well covered throughout her career. But, but you know, basically, she is a, a genius as far as I'm concerned. And they're wonderful painters, paintings to behold. Uh, there's also an article uh, in Brooklyn Rail written by this guy, Je Jeremy Siegler. Um, that actually covers the show that was at the um, the uh, 
Zwerner Gallery um, from last summer. And the catalog for this upcoming show is going to be out in January 2021. So that's the story with this lady, uh, unless there are any questions at this stage of the game. Yes, we have a question. Okay. Um, she outshines Pollock and de Kooning, in my <laughs> oh, in my opinion, uh, a comment. Yeah. Um, yeah. There I was would some. Say she took this to a different place. There were some paintings that were not in the book that you showed me. Oh yes. I, I think I'm changing my favorite painting. I love those <laughs> sunflowers. <laughs> Unbelievable. There's right, a whole series of those. There's oh, really? there's literally each of these things is just the tip of the iceberg. Each each piece that I've been showing, there are series that go along with them. Oh, so oh you how can, wonderful. You're you're gonna have you're gonna have a ball when this show comes around. I will. I will. And they'll 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 have more lectures on her. And I'm sure that there is another documentary that's gonna be coming out. That's why they pulled the one that was out there from ninety two. But um, you know, right now this is this is material that's out there and this biography that's done of uh, of her by Patricia Albers it came out in 2011 I believe but it really this woman stayed with her and mm -hmm. and actually what got to got the privilege of watching her paint and writes some of that process down so it's well worth a look it's it's available on Amazon Prime um, so you can pick that one up pretty easy too. That's great. Uh, Thank you for all this information. Yes. Yes, you bet. Next week we're going to do oh. another wonderful abstract painter who's having a show that's coming around and they're doing a retrospective of her work. Her name is Alma Thomas and she was one of the, what they call the Washington Color School. Um, so it, it's it's gonna be she's she's quite the colorist and and a wonderful uplifting um, set of work. Okay, we have no more questions. Thank right. you, Larry. All right, okay. thank you all for coming. Okay. All right, bye everyone. Bye bye.